seconds, my days long, days long. Marching from just to singing them same songs, same songs. My mama, my brother praying, I make it on. I came on. Stay strong, stay strong. Eight minutes, 46 seconds, my days long, days long. Marching from just to singing them same songs, same songs. My mama, my brother praying, I make it on. I came on. It ain't because I'm reaching that I'm out here preaching. I'm preaching for a reason, saving life this season. Camera phones recording, showing them acting now. Game. I'm Zachary Drapes, and I'm also joined this evening by my guest co-host, Dr. Letitia Brown. Uh, so it's been exactly. Oh, there is Letitia. Go ahead, Letitia. My apologies. No problem. Thanks, Zach. I am so happy to be here. I am Dr. Letitia Brown and looking forward to this important conversation this evening. So it's been exactly one year since the world saw Minneapolis police officer murdered. It has been exactly one year since uh, Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd in cold blood, which unleashed a nationwide reckoning on systemic racism that has only strengthened by the minute and ultimately found a place in the world of sports. With the recent outcome of the verdict, as well as the incidences of violence that shortly followed, including the murder of Makia Bryant, tensions are at an all-time high. And so this evening, we will be joined by athletes, scholars, and activists to discuss the ways that the murder of George Floyd can help us continue the conversation about the targeted systemic state violence against Black people in America. And during this first segment, we will be hearing the perspectives of two Olympic athletes who aren't the least bit shy of speaking truth to power in a variety of capacities. Moshami Robinson is a 2004 track and field gold medalist and co-chair of the U.S. Post of the USOPC Racial and Social Justice Council. And Omar Craddock is an Olympic triple jumper and hip hop artist who in 2020 released his mixtape Red Light Special that included the theme song for this particular episode 846 that you just heard. Moshami and Omar, thank you both for joining us this evening for this important conversation. Hey, thanks for having us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So uh, just to kind of kick things off, and again, I apologize. I'm having a bit of camera trouble. Is get a little bit of camera trouble this evening, but we'll work around it. Um, but just kind of wanted to start the conversation off by really centering on the team. You know, it's been one year later. Um, and then just kind of, obviously, a lot has happened since one year. But just to kind of get a feeling for every, where everybody is at now. So, Mashami, uh, I just wanted to ask you to start off with, how are you feeling now that it's been one year later? Um, you know, I can say that I'm feeling um, optimistic within the USOPC space of um, the sports um, in terms of the work that we've been able to do on the council um, and the reactions that have allowed us to educate and bring awareness to us. Um, things that we really, as athletes, hadn't had a chance to talk about that were really issues with us. Um, as a country, when I look out, um, you know, I come from an educator's perspective um, now when I look at the country in total. Because when I teach young people, I'm always wondering, you know, what is it that they see? You know, what are we presenting to them? And I can honestly say that I would like to see us do a little bit more, you know, be a little bit more um, honest about what we are seeing um, and be more proactive in accountability so that our young people feel safe, so that our young people feel like this is a country that provides and protects for all people of all shades and ethnicities. So, you know, I'm optimistic in the space I'm working in um, and I'm hoping for the same on a uh, national level within the country outside of sports. Thank you. Thank you. Omar. Okay, can you hear me well? You're great. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, I, I'm in agreement with Mushami. Um, uh, with, with obviously what happened, it's sports. So I've been doing music for a while, obviously uh, in the sport for a while uh, too, but when I when I decided to come out with the song, it was because I was obviously affected. Um, not only myself, but a lot of people that look like myself and a lot of us here on this panel. Um, and with the recent 
um, decision, you know, by the IOC to ban, you know, um, protests and then Black Lives Matter apparel. It's just another way to, you know, silence our voices. But in music, right, it's another way of creation and um, inspiration that I was able to channel something inside of me that I feel like can touch other people. Uh, not only because obviously I enjoy music, but music moves people. It moves the masses. Um, and if the message is proper, it can really get into the souls of, of you know, of everybody, of the world, so to speak. Um, and so that's that's the the uh, the standpoint that I'm coming in on. Um, I, I would protest and use my voice. But you see that, like I said, they're trying to or they've already passed that we cannot protest. So with that being said, if we're being silenced in that arena, well, I'm going to still use my voice in another arena and make sure that it's a, a bit louder. You know, um, um, and in the song, obviously, you see that I say we've been marching and protesting, singing these same songs. So we've been doing this over and over and over again. Uh, and it just it shows and proves that there's nothing new under the sun, you know, and it's something that we have to continue to talk about, not only continue to talk about, but actually get active about. Um, and that's that's where my standpoint came from. Um, and even even before George Floyd. Uh, and I'm pretty sure we'll get into more of that. But, you know, when I was in college and the whole Trayvon Martin thing happened, um, even when I was younger, you know, when I was 12 years old, that was my first time having an interaction with the police. And it was just it was very extreme, you know. So, again, music moves the masses. M music moves the world. And, and um, I really just wanted to tap into people's souls in that manner. Thank you, Omar. What you just said has made me think of two questions that I hope both of you will feel comfortable talking about. The first one is in thinking about the banning of Black Lives Matter and protests at the upcoming Olympics, this idea that there is a way that sport is not political. And so everyone says, oh, let's keep politics out of sports. Let's just have our athletes play. And then when you were mentioning Trayvon Martin, it just conjured up these images of how we continue to live in a society in which we don't view Black children as children. And so I guess my question to the both of you would be, what are your thoughts on these two important issues? I'll tackle the first one with um, when we talk about even with the IOC and they want to talk about something being political. Um, I have to go back to that to me is always a way to not really deal with the issue that we're talking about. Um, we're talking about melanated athletes and um, black athletes who experience things in a country in which they live in every single day um, with very human experiences, very normal lifestyles that we don't feel protected. Um, we don't feel seen in a country that we go and we compete for. And when you go into a space that's supposed to be inclusive, should be diverse and speaks to the spirit of peace and joy and inclusion, when an athlete has an opportunity in the greatest moment of their life um, with all the support to, to speak to the world and say, I need you to understand that there's more to my life than me jumping, throwing, swimming or fencing. And when I'm home, I don't feel safe. And I just want you to notice that there's something going on because again, a demonstration with silence is quite peaceful, right? And so for um, the IOC to continuously speak on um, the Black Lives Matter movement or concept, the truth of the matter is a black life does matter. You know, if I, I'm not gonna allow anyone to use the idea that my human life, just like everyone else's matters, to decide to politicize it as a way to not actually affect change for individuals who have been historically marginalized and silenced. So, you know, for that, you know, I push back um, in the, with the IOC for continuously speaking to um, us in particular. Um, I say that because there are 207 nations that compete the one nation that they chose to pick out gestures that are quite peaceful to say that we can't do. And we are a nation that brings in a lot of the TV viewership. We bring in a lot of the content, particularly the melanated athletes. And so when you are pretty much saying you can't say this, you're saying that you don't want us there. And I feel if you don't want us there, you don't want the revenue that we bring, right? Um, I'm believing that the USOPC is preparing to respond in a way 
that is supporting Team USA and Team USA athletes. As far as our young people, mm, I want the world to remember that our children are the future, all of them, all of them, the melanated ones, every last one of them. And so for any law enforcement structure, any adult run societal structure, it is important that we remember that the children, all of our children, we are responsible for taking care of first. So we can't respond to our children as though they are adults with sensible understanding and, and way to rationalize decision-making. You know, we have to be better about that. And I can say that with a stern and straight face as an educator, because often the responses that I see to our young people, they are quite different than the responses that we are mandated to have as an educator, given the same exact circumstances. So, you know, I just would employ for further conversation to be had with individuals that find themselves dealing with young people that are in uh, mental states that are in physical altercations and how we handle those things without um, deadly weapons in order to actually de uh, deescalate and defuse the circumstance. Thank you. And I just kind of wanted to piggyback off of what Mashami was saying and apply that to, to you, Omar, especially when it comes to um, your various endeavors, not just what you do in the athletic world, but also your music career. Um, you know, we recently had a conversation about, you know, what your music means to you and how you want to convey that message about the sanctity and the value of Black life, not just when it comes to what you do on the track, but also in your music. Talk a little bit more about what your music means to you um, and how that has really uh, fueled your desire to speak out and to be unapologetic about that. Right, right. Um, music, as I've already stated, it moves the masses. Um, I've been doing music since I was around 10, 11 years old. And the, the type of music I always wanted to create was something that was putting and uh, an idea on we can do and be better. Uh, the music that we listen to today um, obviously doesn't represent that, right? Um, I told you in, in our uh, interview um, that, you know, it's, it's a lot of uh, uh, misogynistic music or, you know what I mean, anything that's over-sexualizing people. Uh, and so with my music, I want people to actually use their intellect, right? Um, and actually see what's going on. Uh, when When I created 846, I was actually training and I'm listening to the instrumental just play over and over. And then the melody came to my head and then the images, right? Im images became, uh, began popping them to my head and I'm seeing Trayvon, I'm seeing Sandra Bland, Mike Brown, all these, all these uh, people, um, in including George Floyd, obviously for the sake of the song, eight minutes, 46 seconds. My day is long and we understand eight minutes and 46 seconds. If you're suffocating somebody, I can't breathe for eight, almost nine minutes. It's hard enough for somebody to, to hold their breath for 10 seconds, let alone eight minutes and 46 seconds. So my music is to represent what's happening in your face. Um, the same as what Mushami said, I'm not afraid to speak about it because it's the truth. It's not anything that, you know, I'm just I'm speculating on. Um, again, in, in the song, I say uh, in 91 was Rodney King. So what are we talking about? It, it wasn't on a phone, but it was on a camera. Right. And it's the same thing. It's the same thing under the sun. And it repeats over and over. So as opposed to creating music that maybe make people feel good and want to dance and get drunk and high in the club. I want you to at least listen to it. You can listen to it on the way to the club and maybe be like, you know what? I might see some of my brothers and sisters out here and I know it's going to get real. It's going to. It's going to go up out here. It's going, it's going to get active out here. So maybe when I'm driving by, they might hear the song and turn around like, you know what? Yeah, we need to leave. Let's go home. Uh, in, in, in relation to children, I'm about to be a father myself in the next seven months or so. And I, I can't imagine losing my child, right? And, and at, at an alarming rate, these kids look like myself. I'm, I just turned 30, so I can only, we take 16 years off of my life. I'm 14 again. Take a few more years off. I believe Tamir Rice was 12 when, when he, he met his demise. I'm, I create music for them. So when they're hearing it, they're not hearing about, okay, I'm going to go to this little twerk party. I'm going to go get drunk and hide. Now, nah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to realize that I'm going to get my brothers and my sisters to be inside, and we're going to do something different. We're going to change this narrative because they... 
the man's already got something on us anyway. They already uh, putting out a narrative about us anyway. So we have to change that. And that's what my music is about. My music is, is dear to me because it actually has meaning. It actually, when I created this project, I was listening to, to Marvin Gaye. And, and it was, uh, what's going on, right? Mother, mother, why are, you know what I'm saying? Wait, what, what's the lyrics? How I go? Um, of you uh, crying. Yeah. Brother, brother, brother. You, you know what I'm saying? It's so many of you dying. Why? And this was Marvin Gaye during that time. Uh, uh, Tupac said it in a song. They don't give a F about us. Michael Jackson said it in a song. So again, it's just to show the people, right, that look at us as if we're the criminals, <laughs> as if we're the evildoers. They look at us that way. Cool. Now I'm speaking to my people and I'm telling you, listen, this is who you are. You are actually the children of God, right? You are the compassionate people that this Bible speaks of. So that's who we need to be. That's what we need to present. It's another song in the project called Unity. And I say it's time for us to stand up because they need us. The children need us. But over time, we've been led astray. Over time, we've been we've been doing what they've wanted us to do. And so, again, I want my peers to speak up because the ones behind us are looking for a way to go. And even these children now in, that's in the music industry, they still making this crazy, turned up, shoot them up, kill them music. And, and these, are, these are kids. These are kids making this kind of music and they dance into it and a TikTok and all these viral things. This is what's in the people's face. So again, my music is, is real. It's something that I can feel. It's something that you can feel. It's something that everybody has seen over and over again. What we're saying today is nothing made up. It's not made up. And as and and for the sake of the whole George Floyd, he was murdered on film. So what are we really talking about? <laughs> we got to do something about it. And that's that's a part of why I chose to use music because again, mu music mu moves people's souls. Music moves people's ideas and, and can make them do anything. There's, there's a lot of people I'm sure that have listened to any kind of killing music and probably decided to go kill somebody. You listen to some sad music, you're probably crying. You know, I'm just trying to tug at that heart string that's going to make you do something better and more positive for your for your people and your, your people group, rather. That's really, uh, appreciate your honesty on that. And I love how you gave a shout out to Marvin Gaye because let's not forget this month, 50 years ago, was the release of What's Going On. And many right. of those themes that were expressed and articulated in What's Going On is the same things that we're hearing about um, 50 years later in the present moment. And so much of your music has really carried on that tradition. And like you said, you know, you referenced Tupac and Michael Jackson, who expressed very similar sentiments of what was going on in their day. Um, and that that continuation and that intersection of, you know, athleticism and music and, and in this case, sports and hip hop uh, is something that's very organic and something that you can't separate. Um, and I know and I did have some technological difficulties and my sincerest apologies for that. But I don't know if you got to this, but Mushami, I just kind of wanted to bring it back to you in terms of talking about the work that you're doing with the USOPC Racial and Social Justice Council. You know, so much of this move on the part of many sport governing bodies and within sports organizations to a, to tackle racial and social justice came out of what happened a year ago uh, this weekend. Talk a little bit more out at length about the work of the Racial and Social Justice Council within the U.S. OPC. Um, I appreciate that opportunity um, because one, I definitely have to give a shout out to everyone that shows up um, that's on the council, um, definitely to the core team so that people can be aware. Um, we've been talking about Rule 50 in the USOPC Athlete Advisory Council since February when we had our meeting in December, um, in February prior to um, the pandemic shutting everything down. And so um, it came up when myself and Wallace were looking at the new Rule 50 that the IOC had just put out. And you know, we, we told them then in as a group, we just, we weren't comfortable with the language, we weren't comfortable with the defining, you know, uh, us as athletes and speaking directly to what we felt were the black US athletes. So that started the conversation then. Um, once this happened and you know we all 
lived and witnessed those eight minutes and 46 seconds, it sparked the conversation again with a small group of athletes that were just, you know, understanding that we in our country experienced some different things as a collective, meaning, you know, the beauty of Team USA, when these athletes, when we put on the uniform, the color that we see is red, white, and blue when we go represent our country. And when we're individuals in this country and we're not recognized as equal or even valuable as human beings, um, we have to be able to, you know, be in spaces that people want us to show up in and be great and, and speak on that. So uh, 15 or so of us got to discussing some things and um, the USOPC wanted to do an athlete town hall. But prior to that, we had we hosted a track and field athlete town hall to really get a sense of what um, a majority of the melanated athletes were experiencing and thinking about Rule 50 and how we felt about it. And um, in speaking with Sarah Hirschlin, our CEO, we really got down into the deep about what the USOPC looks like, what our experiences have been with the USOPC. And I think what she realized, it wasn't just about what happened with George Floyd. Um, for all athletes and all people, there are some systematic issues um, of discrimination and marginalization that have been set up um, in our country that has left behind and disenfranchised so many individuals, particularly those of um, black and brown color. And so, you know, to have an opportunity to work with the council, for her to say, Moshami, you know, let's get an athlete-led council. Let's talk to the group and let's cover everything. You know, let's talk about the protests and demonstration and what that means to you guys and what that looks like for us and how we support that. Let's talk about athlete expression and advocacy. You know, these were things that athletes had come up with that we wanted to do. And she she believed that that was important. And then she said, you know, we'll also take a look at institutional change and awareness. And then the last bucket that we're going to dive into is race and discrimination. Um, we believe that it's very important that now that we're in this and we set out as a council to put out recommendations so that the USOPC can create policies, not only for the USOPC and sports, but policies that the NCAA system can pick up, policies that the AAU system can pick up, and honestly, policies that any corporate organization can pull and put in place in terms of having a diverse, equitable, and inclusive and accessible way of having um, diversity and seeing having people be seen and heard. Um, so for the council, they have done some incredible work. We have about three Zoom meetings a week for these different buckets, um, but we have a standing meeting of the core team with our experts on the core team. That happens every Friday at 3 p.m. And the work I can say is very thoughtful. And I'm proud that when a multitude of diverse people get together, the product that you get is the best that you can get because we can only be the best at anything when we have everybody at the table with some kind of voice and perspective on it. And I think that's what we want are learning as a council and just truly are appreciating in this human experience that we're having. So um, I'm very excited about some future announcements that are gonna be made in terms of the games. Um, I think our athletes are gonna feel proud and confident um, and it's really built the strong relationship with the USOPC and it's gonna truly bridge the gap where our athletes and our um, organization executives felt that there was a disconnect. I think we're finally now hitting home and for the painting behind me um this is full circle um so people like omar myself we're just vessels to our ancestors um that pioneer before um those gentlemen to all the work that they've done um and to the great lee evans who we just recently lost i'm just grateful to be standing in a place to be used to bring his work forward and all those others um for some equity and equality and we are the thought leaders team usa and we're going to lead that charge and we're going to lead it in the right way so i'm excited about that and that's what the council's been doing Amen to that. Amen to that. So um, just to kind of wrap this first segment up, um, how can folks follow uh, both of you, uh, social media and all your other different outlets? Uh, Omar, how can folks follow you in the uh, For me, everything, I'm Omar Goodness, and that's goodness with two Ds, uh, Twitter, Instagram, uh, and whatever else, social media outlet. Um, I have a website, journeyglobally.com as well. That's where I do a lot of my exclusive work, um, whether that's with the sport of uh, track and field and then my personal things in music, fitness and all that other stuff. Uh, but that's where it is. Journeyglobally.com and then Omar Goodness on everything else. And you all can find me, um, Miss Moshami, M-S, um, in my first name, M-O-U-S-H-A-U-M-I. Um, and that's on Twitter and Instagram as well. Um, and I have a website, Moshami Movement. 
Com, um, a part of what I've been able to do in giving back is I've decided to create a nonprofit for our teenagers um, called All Ears um, to prevent teenage suicide and bullying. So I'm just uh, getting there, getting the footwork done. Um, if no one else wants to build it, I'll create it and those that want to join. So um, there's also a GoFundMe page, but tap in. It's the Moshami Movement.com and um, Miss Moshami um, is where you can find me on social media. So thank you so much. Thank you both so much. I wanted to, if I could just leave one thing, I wanted to say like at the end of it all, once we win, everybody will actually start to win. And I think that's what uh, these other entities need to uh, start to realize since we are speaking of the same things over and over, uh, all of these um, situations that happen to us as so-called black people, uh, once we reverse that, and we begin to win, everybody else will win. We see that in the economics as well, um, in the economic structure when it comes to us buying or, or not. You know, if we decide to sit out, there's a lot of things that can actually falter because of the, the infrastructure and power that we actually bring. So when we win, everybody wins. If, if that's what they want to do anyway, if they're talking about, you know, coming together and all this, once we win, everybody will win. Thank you again. You both have been wonderful. Thank you. All righty. So th our thanks to Moshami and Omar for their great insight and continuing to use their platforms as athletes to speak truth to power. And so now um, I'm going to hand it back over to Letitia, who will introduce our next guest, uh, who is currently one of the most cutting edge sports historians of our time, who will give us a great insight into um, how the history very much intersects with the present day. Uh, so Letitia, why don't you do the honors of introducing our next guest? Thank you. I am beyond humbled and honored to introduce Dr. Amir Rose Davis, who is a historian, public speaker, and co-host of the sensational feminist sports podcast, Burn It All Down. Welcome. Uh, thanks for having me. So good to be in conversation with y'all as always. Yeah, in this segment, we're transitioning to a discussion of, oh, no, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Letitia, you go ahead. Okay, uh, my my apologies. There's a bit of technological difficulties, Amira, my apo our, our apologies for that. So really just kind of wanted to get your perspective because obviously you do so much amazing work around the intersections of sport, history, race, and gender. Um, given this current moment one year later, uh, since the murder of George Floyd. What's your perspective on where we were then and where we are now? Yeah, I mean, what a year it's been. Um, I think we're in a very interesting and critical place. Um, and so what we have seen over the course of the year um, is a disruption um, to many things, a disruption to institution, a disruption to, you know, regular pace of life, a disruption to, um, you know, foundational thoughts and ideas about things. Um, and in that moment of disruption, um, especially in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, you saw a needle start to move. Now, when, uh, if you take us back 12 months, nine months, a lot of times I would get the question, well, what was different about this moment of George Floyd? As Omar just said, right, this is not new. Um, this wasn't even the first time we had a black man on tape saying, I can't breathe while we watched his life slip away. Um, and I was like, honestly, that's a hard question to answer because um, what seemed new was corporate response. What seemed new was non-black people taking notice of it um, and speaking out about it. But in that moment, we saw a needle move, we saw, um, you know, uh, another increase in wave of athletic activism. We saw a reckoning with many things. Um, and then we started to see what that response is look at like. Some of that has been structural and really impressive. The work that Mashami and y'all are doing at, um, you know, the Olympic Committee, for instance, is like changing things at foundational points. And then in some places we're seeing painted words like equality. And then everybody's like, boom, we did it. We ended racism. Like, 
we painted it in the end zone, bam, we're done. And so right now, a year later, I think we're at this point, right? Where you have this kind of moment where people feel like, hey, we're approaching normal, we're returning to normal. And I think the question has to be, well, what does that mean? Right? What are we returning to normal of a year ago where also we don't have time to talk about critical issues or we're not, you know, willing to have these conversations? We want to put our institutions back how they were, even though we've had a year, you know, evidencing that they, they don't work and that they're harmful. I mean, I think that's the junction that we're at, which is like, what does a return mean? What does a year later, you know, require us to think about when we think about? moving forward. And I think that question is being answered in a variety of ways. Um, and so to me, I think that's exactly where we are. We're at this moment where it's exciting to see, you know, some of the changes happening and, um, you know, some of the, what has come over the last year. And then you also see people kind of grappling with, you know, what are the limits of that? Or has the moment passed? Is the movement moment moving? How do we push past like performative politics? Um, and I think that that's where we find ourselves. And that's the question that we're going to have to collectively answer over the next few months as we as we move forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just really kind of piggying back off of that, just sort of, you know, looking at being able to sort of distinguish between performative activism versus legitimate and sincere activism. Um, and you think about, you know, sort of like, you know, let's take the WNBA, for example, because they set the model or they have set the model from the very beginning, because let's not forget the WNBA players before Colin Kaepernick took a knee, they were the ones who were wearing T-shirts saying change starts with us. So they have already been on the front lines speaking truth to power way before Colin Kaepernick uh, took a knee and engaged in his own form of protests. And it's almost as if from what from my perspective, it almost seems like the there's this continuous write off of the WNBA. You know, even though the WNBA is literally changing the world as we speak, I mean, my goodness, they changed the course of American political history in Georgia, and yet they're still not giving the credit that they deserve. But yet, you know, those who engage in this sort of performative activism tend to get more fanfare than those who are actually doing legit on the ground work like the WNBA. Um, so really, uh, just to kind of ask you, um, do you think that, um, the, is it fair to say that the WNBA really has kind of set the model for what not just activism should look like, but also what democracy looks like in power and in practice? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that, you know, what you laid out there is a tale as old as time, right? We know um, the way that Black women um, athletes have a long activist tradition, um, you know, I Y'all hear me talk about it all the time. Um, and we know that that's also continued to be overlooked and marginalized historically at the moment in time, then what it looks like now. Um, I think the W has definitely gotten um, some more engagement. And now they're at a point where, you know, talking to some folks over there on the social justice council and things like that, where they're like at a point where they're like, okay, we're still driving it forward. We have a thing, you know, they just released their, their kind of critical focus for um, this season where they're looking at um, health disparities, um, especially given COVID, especially given the disproportionate rates of, of um, not just COVID, but like access to healthcare in rural and black and brown communities. They're looking at rights for trans athletes, especially looking at all of the uh, youth legislation that's passing through courts right now. I mean, these are their focal points where they're saying like, this is not something that we were doing for a moment, but this is our way of driving it forward. And I think that they're trying to figure out what does it mean now to have laid this blueprint and then continue to model it. And I would say that the blueprint that they laid is so instructive when we think about collective organizing or activism in general. And that is, um, twofold. One, it's collective within the organization itself, right? That they, they if you've watched uh, 144, which is now available on their platform, on the ESPN platforms, a documentary inside the Wubble, as they're doing this, you'll see that it's not that everybody's in agreement, right? But that they are communicative and coming together and saying, we recognize our strength is in solidarity and that we are going to talk it out here and then we are going to move as one. And that is what the force is going to be. 
the players are bringing the league along, right? The players over time have constantly pushed the league to get behind them. And so part of it was that they had the league and the strength of the league behind them. Um, but one of the things that they did that was so critical is when they were finding themselves in a situation where they wanted to figure out how, what to do about Kelly Loeffler and how best to move forward as activists, they didn't try to reinvent any wheels. They said, what we have is a platform and we have motivation, we have inspiration, and this is what we want to do. Let's let's figure out what else we need. So they called activists on the ground who are registering voters in Georgia. They called activists on the ground who've been at organizing protests and, and working on these issues. They called scholars, they called Kimberly Crenshaw and was like, hey, we're black women, we're queer women. You know, we want to understand intersectionality, not how it's used as like a kind of pop term on social media, but like from the source, from Kimberly Crenshaw who wrote the theory, like, you know, school us, right? And I think that this is, um, so, can't be overlooked, right? They connected. Um, within themselves and beyond it in on the ground in Atlanta. And like you said, we saw what happened. We saw the impact that happened when uh, Reverend Warnock was first doing his campaign in the summer. Um, the, the Warnock team says it's like about 9%. He was pulling about 9% before um, the W got involved, right? Like that's a huge impact. Um, and I think that that is really important um, to think about as we move forward, because it's like, well, what connections um, help us fortify these these um, solidarities? Like, what what is required between athletes, between activists, between scholars, um, between people in different piece, pieces of organizations? I mean, I think that's a blueprint that is is really important to follow, and I think that it goes hand in hand with doing the work to making sure that as we tell these narratives about activism or about protest in sports um, or about sports in general, that we're accounting for the marginalized sporting lives as well, because um, that will, and as it so often does, shines a light on power dynamics in a way that makes sure that we're really accounting for what real and impactful change will look like for everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. That was absolutely incredible and just makes me reflect upon the ways that, you know, there have always been Black women activists. There have always been Black women that are activists within the realm of sport, but the ways that their voices and contributions are marginalized is, you know, it's nothing new under the sun. We if we were to think about Wyomia Tyus, who was the first American to win back-to-back -back gold medals in the 100 meter dash, but many people believe it was Carl Lewis, even though she accomplished that feat in 1968, it just continues to show that while things may change, they also stay the same. If we think about Rodney King and the videotape, and we think about George Floyd, it's not very different from when there were postcards with images of lynchings and picnics at the same time. And it's just important that we can't forget the trajectories and these histories and the ways that things continue to move in cyclical ways. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that is so important, right? Um, there's there's a way that there's discussion about history, right? Like, you know, some people say, oh, if you don't know your history, you're going to repeat it. Or, you know, there's, you know, raging debates. There's a bill in Texas right now that would make it, you know, illegal for to teach about slavery or, you know, anti-Mexican oppression, um, right? And like, this is a real thing where we see history under attack in specific ways that wants to sanitize it, that thinks it should make you feel warm at night, it should make you feel good. Um, and then there's people who want history, like historians to be like predictors, like, oh, we can see the future. And I think it's important to understand that like part of what we say when we're like, no, we got to get the history right, is because people call upon it to build foundations that they're building, whether it's an activist foundation, right, well, it's an understanding of the context. And what you don't want to do is build on a faulty foundation, right? And, and this is what I say, like our narratives of athletic activism, if we don't include 
you know, black women especially, that's a faulty foundation, right? And the the a lot the ways that we've seen things be disrupted before, you know, what you're trying to do is shore up that space and saying, hey, here are these moments where other things were possible. And things aren't predetermined, right? Things aren't even a linear journey. And I think that to me is what's really important is saying like, this is a moment in time in which things are in in motion. Things are in flux, right? We know because we've been here before that the kind of corporate response or the permissibility or the way that people who are not normally invested in um, you know, black liberation that normally wouldn't necessarily be throwing corporate sponsorship at it. Um, we know that that this is not something that they might be here in five months or five years, right? And so you have an interest convergence, and over the past year, for a number of reasons, that occurred. And so it's like, what are you going to do with that opportunity? To try to extend it, right? To try to build upon it. And I think history is really important because it allows us to first of all confront some of the narratives that we have that have built faulty foundations. But then it also reminds us that there are a range of possibilities and there's a range of pathways to take and that things are not set in stone and that there has been moments of opportunity um, that have then closed off. And it reminds us, in my opinion, when we talk about that performative act- activism, that is that is to me like what, embodies this the most, right? Where we can see, for instance, the night in August where we had a wildcat strike and people were like, we're not playing. And when it, it went from the Bucks to the whole NBA to the W, right, to baseball, to hockey, right? Naomi Osaka pulled out and they canceled the tournament. Like this was a moment. This was 24 hours where there this this was a huge moment of showing what it looked like to have solidarity across multiple sports that made sports stop in a way that they hadn't until like before March when they stopped for COVID. And within 48 hours, play resumed, right? But we had that moment of responsibility. We had that moment where we could see possibilities open up. And I think that that's really important because those are the, the times where we can say, well, what do we do with this moment that we have? And then those of us who are watching critically say, in the days that followed, what came out of it? And that's when we can say, oh, so you you wrote another word on the, on the basketball court, right? It's not surprising that the IOC is like, you can't wear Black Lives Matter, but you're fine, we're wearing a, a, a word like peace or equality or you know whatever, because those are the same words that we've seen on jerseys and we've seen on blackboard, ba- uh, backboards and we've seen written in end zones, right? And I think that that just punctuates how performative some of the responses became, even the gesture of kneeling. And so I think that part of it is it compels us to push and question, well, what does this mean? And does it mean the same thing as it did a year ago? Because like you said, like we said from the top of the show, we're, we're in a different place than we were a year ago. And I kind of wanted to touch on your point about solidarity um, that you hit on very effectively, especially within the context of what we're seeing right now with regards to the Middle East, particularly the Israeli and Palestinian conflict, which has obviously been going on for decades and it has only amplified um, over time now. And what you're seeing is more solidarity being shown with uh, the Palestinians than you had seen in years prior. Um, And I thought that was very interesting. Um, And then when you look at history, you'll see that it's not, you know, a new phenomenon. You know, this is something that has been going on forever, for going on for years, especially when it comes to solidarity between uh, African-Americans and and the Palestinians. Um, You know, you think about Malcolm X uh, and his frequent travels to Africa and to the Middle East and expressing support for the Palestinian people. And then obviously the Black Panther Party showing uh, solidarity with the Palestinian people. And then you translate that 50 years later. And now you're seeing athletes like Kyrie Irving and Damian Lillard, Dwight Howard, who has expressed uh, support for the Palestinian people in the past before and had gotten backlash for it. But now just in a short amount of time, that opinion is starting to become a little bit more mainstream, almost. You know, I want to be careful how I say that because it's almost 
you know, something that is more commonly accepted and more commonly visible. Um, and how do you think that'll translate within the context of what you just described of, you know, the difference between that performance activism for versus that legitimate activism and what you're seeing with regards to athletes starting to speak out more about issues that they had not been talking about, or at least American athletes had not been speaking out before in years past, specifically with regards to uh, Palestine? Yeah, no, I think this is a great question because one of the differences in this kind of last five years of the renaissance of athletic activism than we've seen in decades before is that I think Dave um, Zyron had a great piece where he talked about the activism stopping at the water's end, right? And that's because if you think of Muhammad Ali, if you think about the 60s, right? If you think about the Olympic Project for Human Rights, um, a lot of that was grounded in global liberation, right? Um, the Olympic Project for Human Rights was particularly building their boycott, their proposed boycott of the Olympic Games in 68 around the inclusion of South Africa and Rhodesia, right? So they were worried about apartheid. Um, the, the poster that Harry and um, them drew up one of the posters has a black fist coming out of Africa and a black fist coming out of the United States and meeting in, under the kind of um, symbol of the Olympic Project for Human Rights. And that was a huge feature, right, of what black athletic activism looked like was these kind of points of solidarity. You talked about movement solidarities that were there, absolutely. And this was another one. Um, and I think that we've seen that kind of tested over the last few years. Of course, probably the biggest one was the NBA. Um, when a lot of outspoken athletes were kind of like, no, like, you know, we can't touch that. We can't talk about, you know, anything that's happening in China with the NBA um, because it's a huge, it's a huge market. And we see that that, that became um, a boundary, uh, a limitation on what they would or would not speak out about. And I think that that's what, when we're talking about, like what needle moves, what becomes permissible, it's also really important to watch you know, where those limitations are. And so I think you're right that we're seeing a little bit of a difference here. Um, I would also throw out um, Ziara King. A lot of Black women in the NWSL have also been using Instagram to talk about Palestine, um, Neka Gumake, um, you know, and, and as well as anti-Semitism um, that has been on the rise in the United States at this moment. But a lot, you know, talking about Palestine in a way that parallels some of the stuff we were seeing in the 60s in a way that says, what does it look like um, to think about what liberation means globally? What does it look like to talk about colonization? What does it look like to talk about settler colonization, right? Um, there was a, a great uh, article about um, surfers in Hawaii um, not being able to compete under the Hawaiian flag coming up in, in Tokyo and being able to take that conversation and put it in a conversation about Palestine and put all these solidarities together, I think, we're seeing more of those possibilities of, of conversations than we certainly have before. Um, definitely no, no questions asked. I think that that is definitely something to watch moving forward in terms of um, you know, what, what consequences are meted down if people continue to speak out, if people feel more comfortable talking about that and how global these kind of solidarities um, prove to be. I would say, um, you know, I know just, academically, um, a number of us who work on various areas of the world, um, one of the, the parallels that we have long studied is United States and Israel and in South Africa and the way sports are used um, in those areas to kind of bolster our image of a nation state and how marginalized people um, within those spaces have also used them, that very thing, sports to push back on it, whether it's black athletes here, black South Africans, um, of course, but also my colleague Tamir Sorek has a book ab about East Jerusalem in the way that um, both Arab Israelis as well as Palestinians use soccer to try to do that same thing. And so I think that sports has always woven through these struggles. And I think that we're at a moment where sporting voices are continuing to discover their voice on um, an issue that for too long, you know, they certainly weren't weren't willing to touch. But the the precedent of doing that, I mean like the features of athlete activism in the 60s were really very international. And so, um, you know, to me, I think that it's in many ways a new moment for what we see in the last five years, but it's actually a return to a kind of um, global 
mindset in terms of activist athletes. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. Everything that you've said has really resonated in beautifully segues into our following segment on advocacy. Thank you for your time so much. Yes, thank you. Always great to hold space with y'all. Absolutely. It's always great to hear from someone as extraordinary as uh, Dr. Mary Rose Davis. And then also can't forget, um, give a shout out to her um, because she got a new position coming up at uh, University of Texas at Austin. So we want to give our give our applause to her for that. Um, and she's going to be part of a great tradition of uh, athlete activism. So, um, and there she is now. So we just wanted to give you a shout out. For I know that. I'm going to go take on the eyes of Texas. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. All right. So our thanks to Dr. Davis um, and all the extraordinary work that she continues to do. And like uh, Letitia said, that's going to make us uh, that's going to allow us to translate into our final segment for this evening, which talks a lot a lot more about the advocacy side of things uh, when it comes to um, athlete activism. And who better than Dr. Akila Carter Francisque? I want to I always I want to make sure I get her name right. Um, she is the executive director of the San Jose State University Center for Sport, Society, and Social Change. Um, so we want to bring her in now. Um, there she is. Akila, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, and a, a great opportunity. So looking forward to share. Absolutely. Um, and first and foremost, we do want to extend our condolences because um, this week, uh, San Jose State lost um, one of their most prestigious alums in Lee Evans, uh, who was one of the greatest, not only one of the greatest Olympians, but also one of the greatest human rights activists um, who really set the model for the modern day athlete activist movement. Um, so uh, really, uh, just to kind of look at the advocacy side of things and really just continuing along this theme of reflection of where we were a year ago and where we are now, uh, what has this past year been for you with regards to the work that you that you've been doing? Gosh, the, the year in itself has been quite dynamic. Um, everything from, uh, again, serving as a hub to consult um, and, you know, receive some feedback and direction from to a year of educating. Um, not only those administrators, staff and coaches, but also students um, and community that's really been interested in understanding uh, the, the race and, and racism. Um, and it's been interesting because it's always been sort of through the guise of sport, which apparently is, is something that we saw to take center stage, but seems to be palatable too. Um, for everyone to sort of understand and sort of be on a level playing field when they're learning. Um, but it's also been one that's been, you know, quite heartbroken. There are um, a, a number of people that are, you know, challenged in the sense of multitasking, <laughs> everything having to do work, school, raise children, take care of loved ones um, as well. So helping in the, the sort of the coping through the complexity um, the coping through the sadness of loss um, as people have lost family members, people have lost friends um, and loved ones through this time period, either due to COVID um, or just due to, you know, sort of our natural state. Um, and then, you know, many just having challenges by being isolated. And so some of the mental health and well-being issues have definitely come to the fore, particularly when we talk about our student athletes and our students, you know, being at San Jose State University that have not had to endure anything like this before, um, that have had their um, athletic uh, talents, their athletic opportunities, their, that experience kind of come to a halt and had to pivot, um, not knowing essentially how to navigate and may not have sort of receive some of the support um, that they could have received in these time periods, or just, you know, again, organizations learning through this process with them. Um, so um, it's been a number of, of, of opportunities, a number of challenges, um, like I said, quite dynamic, um, but I'm glad that we as an institute were able to be there to lend a voice, um, to provide some information uh, and to help people through these moments. And, and in many ways they've helped us too.
Absolutely. And also, um, I just wanted to uh, go off on sort of, you know, the service providing side of things, really, which is extremely crucial. And you touched upon mental health. What we've been seeing, and also let's not forget that May is also Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, right. So this is just a daily reminder of the need to take care of oneself, to prioritize one's mental health, um, and to seek out help uh, if need be, and recognize that there's no shame in that. And if anything, what this past year has taught us, not just with regards to COVID, certainly, but also uh, you know, systemic injustice of the toll that takes on one's mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and how important it is for athletic departments to provide those resources on a regular basis um, and also culturally relevant and competent services on a regular basis. Um, and then really just, you know, on the advocacy side of things, what you've been seeing um, on college campuses have been, um, you know, student athletes really taking up the mantle for activism mm -hmm. in extraordinary ways and also at tremendous risk too, uh, just given the whole structure of how so-called amateur athletics is designed. And now you're seeing more and more uh, student athletes starting to organize amongst themselves, put pressure on institutions to do more, to say more and to provide more. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if you could talk a little bit more about the work that uh, specifically the uh, Center for Sports Society and Social Change has been doing uh, to sort of meet the student athletes where they're at. Yes. Well, one of the first things that um, I, I did kind of coming into this space was uh, knowing that I wanted to center mental health and wellness uh, within the Institute sort of as an annual theme, not knowing that COVID was on the horizon, not knowing that we were going to have a year um, to a year and a half with no sport uh, was to go ahead and get myself um, certified in mental health first aid. Um, I did mental health first aid, mental health first aid for adults that work with youth um, through my own institution and through, you know, some regional um, organizations just for my own edification. Again, I'm not a mental health provider, but I wanted to do my best because in many ways I'm on the front lines of those student athlete engagements, just as coaches, just as faculty, just as academic advisors are. And so it was just really sort of getting myself steeped in that to hold these robust conversations. I then was able to, um, uh, you know, join in a, a great uh, group and sort of collective conversation with um, sports psychologists and sports social workers. Dr. Emmett Gill was one of those. Um, and as you know, social workers um, or the Alliance for Social Workers in Sport, a big number of those um, individuals are in those spaces as well. And, um, you know, just having those robust conversations. But one of the things that I found in having those conversations that we were in many ways preaching to the choir, like we knew what needed to happen. We knew um, what needed to take place. We knew where the gaps were. Um, and so I found a space in there to say, hey, let's take this conversation to the people. Let's take this conversation to those with boots on the ground. And so started Sport Conversations for Change with the Institute, which was one initially that was going to be, you know, an eight week thing, just like COVID this, that we thought it would be. Um, and then we found out it's going to be much, much, much longer that we're in this space. And so it turned into a monthly um, webinar engagement. And Dr. Letitia was was so graced us with her, her expertise during one of our, our programs. But within that held robust conversations, had a mental health provider um, on each webinar with us um, to sort of provide us some understanding, whether it be race, whether it be disability, whether it be um, academic engagement for our student athletes to kind of understand what are some best practices and things that we can do to support those students in those spaces. But in many ways, you know, I, I say this as much as students, but it's also helping those professionals that have not been in this space before either understand what they can do and what they need to do to bolster themselves up so they can be ready, aware and alert in order to then direct those students and walk with them over into these different healthcare um, spaces, these mental health and wellness providers, whether they be a, a psychologist, a counselor, a social worker to move forward. Um, not only did we do that, we created um, uh, our first conference that we had with the Institute, um, our Sports Society and Social Change Conference, and really brought in a number, again, of experts. Uh, Dr. Amira Rose Davis was one of our amazing, amazing panelists that dropped so much knowledge. Um, and within that space and time, wanted to create a space where we talk about moving from words to action, 
you know, having small sessions where, again, professionals could come into these spaces, whether they be coaches, academic advisors, parents, um, student athletes could come into this space and learn about sort of the history that Dr. Davis spoke about um, and understanding why we're in the space that we're in now and why it's so important that we move and pivot by creating policies, by changing our practices um, so we can move towards a culture of understanding um, and an a culture that also recognizes the humanity within these, these young people that we work with. Um, and so those were some of the things that we did um, outside of that, you know, created an internship opportunity. And within that, you know, had interns that definitely um, provided us support. But more than anything, what we wanted to do was also create a space where they can learn some of these best practices, learn some of the, the information from the blueprint. When we think about the work of Dr. Harry Edwards and the Olympic Project for Human Rights and how to engage in activism, how to become steeped in the information how to understand the history, how to communicate with others that have liked causes and in many ways are um, outside of those organizations. You know, when we think about the Olympic Project for Human Rights, um, they didn't go at it alone. You know, they worked with other athletes, they worked with other leaders like a Malcolm X, like a Martin Luther King to understand the, the broader issues at hand and such that they could work as a collective to move forward. And we saw that really become revealed with um, the women of the WNBA, their collectivist efforts in this. And so we're doing that with our students that come in with us per semester um, such that they can use sport, use their education as a platform to bring forth awareness about issues of racism, yes, of sexism, of um, ethnocentrism, of LGBTQ plus issues, of trans issues, of Asian hate, of disability, of mental health and wellness. And so those are the things that we've been doing. And then lastly, I'll just say is, is being able to plug into a number of different environments and communities, um, age groups. One of our, our great presentations we had with the, the Santa Clara County Library, which brought in some middle school children all the way up to retirees. And I think that helps us understand that when we talk about athlete activism, when we talk about these issues of human rights, it's not an age thing. It affects all of us. And at the same time, understanding it's not just a local issue, but it's a global issue. And so being a part of, of great podcasts like this, being a part of panels that are not only happening in our area, um, happening in our nation, but even happening globally, helps us understand, as our Olympians told us in prior um, session, you know, these are global issues that are taking place. But many people are looking to the U.S., um, to see how we react, how we respond. They're looking to the media of how we respond. They're looking to sport and how we respond to these issues. And so just bringing those conversations to the fore is sort of our day-to-day -day, um, engagement and you know what we hope to do and continue to do with the Institute platform. Dr. Carter Francique, as always, <laughs> thank you so much for everything that you do. It is just beyond, beyond amazing. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. So um, we just kind of wanted to close out this evening. Um, and thank you um, to all of our guests for joining us. And uh, Dr. Brown, I do want to thank you for being a co-host um, for this important conversation. Um, before we uh, close out this evening, we do want to take this time, as we had mentioned a couple times in this show, uh, pay tribute to uh, Lee Evans, who passed away this week at the age of 74. He was um, a student, a student athlete at San Jose State in 1967, and he was one of the earliest supporters of the Olympic Project for Human Rights that was mentioned and created by the amazing uh activist scholar, Dr. Harry Edwards, or scholar activist, I should say. Um, and after Tommy Smith and John Carlos made their iconic Black Power salute on the medal stand in Mexico City the following year, Lee Evans uh, engaged in his own form of resistance politics on the medal stand in Mexico City. Yes. Um, in homage of the Black Panther Party, Evans wore a beret, and raised his fist in protest, of course, against systemic racism in the U.S. and beyond. 
Absolutely. And may he uh, rest in power. And the same goes for George Floyd and all those that we lost to systemic injustice. And we will never forget and we will continue uh, fighting and making sure that justice is served across the board. Um, and uh, you know what, uh, Dr. Brown, I do want to ask you, like, how are you doing like one year, one year later? Hmm. That is an interesting question to which there is no easy answer, mm -hmm. especially considering that moments after the verdict, what happened to Makia Bryant happened. I am still here and committed to doing work that recognizes the importance of addressing and naming systemic racism, white supremacy in the US and fighting against it. Absolutely, absolutely, same here. You know, if anything, uh, what it has taught us is to be more vigilant and continue to make sure that we don't lose sight of what is going on. You know, going back to Marvin Gaye 50 years later who reminded us of what is going on. And so being able to utilize all these different uh, resources and outlets to be able to articulate what's going on in an impactful way is the way to go. And we can continue to be the change that we seek in every way imaginable. And certainly what you do, uh, Dr. Brown, and what our guests do and what so many others are doing is just, you know, uh, a reminder of, you know, how much work that we need to be, be doing and that collective solidarity is always a must because we can win together. We can win so many of these battles by having that solidarity. And then I'll just leave with a, one of my favorite quotes is from Keith Boykin, uh, who said that it doesn't matter uh, who was first oppressed, who was who was most oppressed or whether there's identical, they're identically oppressed. What matters is that no group of people should be oppressed. And so by having that collective solidarity, we can be able to dismantle systems of oppression and being able to use sport. Uh, to do so is always very transformative and very impactful. Uh, so our thanks to our guests who joined us this evening. Um, as you can see, being able to support uh, Mushami's movement and her organization and continue to support the work of all of our guests. Um, so be sure to follow us on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, and be sure to follow us uh, on our uh, NBS YouTube channel. On behalf of all of the NBS team, I am Dr. Letitia Brown. And I'm Zachary Draves. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Have a good night.